request is that you be the person to introduce me wherever I might speak uh, anywhere in the country. I'm Brad Sherman from California's best name city, Sherman Oaks. It's an honor to be with you, and I hope that uh, I've been invited to speak because of the wisdom I've a, a, uh, accumulated over the last 20 years in Congress, and not just because I got you the room. But uh, by definition, depending upon your definition, those with disabilities are the largest minority group in the country and one of the few that you may join at any point in your lives. At best, all of us are tabs temporarily able-bodied. Uh, it is also the most disadvantaged economic group in this country. 28.7 percent of those with disabilities are living in poverty. That exceeds any other racial or ethnic group. 22 million working-age disabled adults live in this country. Only one out of three have jobs. You've got other experts to talk to you about disability and about how to, uh, uh, as a community, to overcome the difficulties that you face. I'm here to talk a little bit about how to persuade members of Congress, how to lobby when you don't have a PAC. I'll go through some points. First, have allies and create a coalition. Whatever, when, it, when you hand that paper to a member of Congress or a senator, you're going to want to say this is endorsed by the entire community. The one thing that will make a member of Congress reluctant to help out is the fear that they're going to sign on to your program only to hear from others in the same community that they should have gone in another direction. Second, keep in mind how busy and thinly spread a member of Congress is. I'm talking about disability issues now. I'll be working on banking regulation uh, when I go back to my office. Right before that, I was focused on the Jaffna Peninsula. And if you don't know where that is, that's fine. But it just illustrates that just as the member of Congress doesn't know a lot of what you know, that's because they have to know a lot of things you don't have to know. Uh, so they're um, an inch deep and a mile wide. Uh, the members of Congress, when you meet with them, want to make you happy. First of all, it's a congenital personality disorder. That's why we went into politics. Second, it's an occupational necessity. We need to make as many people as possible happy. And third, you're the good guys. Uh, but when people come to talk to us, we always feel that it's not a no-brainer. The people talking to us always think their proposal is a no-brainer. Of course, everybody. And invariably, what they're proposing is either going to take a lot of political capital and time for the member of Congress they're talking to, or it's going to have strong opposition in the bureaucracy or the ideologies that run around Washington, or it's going to cost government money. So there are very few slam dunks. There are many more opportunities uh, to persuade, but uh, if, if it really didn't cost anything and was spectacular and everybody agreed about it, uh, it would probably be a suspension bill that already passed 20 years ago. Now I want to, now and then there's a, magi a magician who's thrown out of the society for revealing how the tricks are done. I'm about to get thrown out because I want to tell you not what you learn in Politics 101, but in Politicians 101, how to deal with a meeting, how to deal with a request. I was told this by a politician in his 90s back in my area, but I'm sure he's not the only one. He said, Brad, never put it in writing if you can just say it. Never say yes or no if you can just nod. Never nod if you can get by with a smile. And best of all, see if you can get by with just a wink. <laughs> what you do not want out of a meeting is a smile or a general belief that the person you're talking to loves you very much and wants you to love them, but really hasn't committed to anything. 
Now, a lot of people come and they're just real happy to see a member of Congress. They want a selfie. That's fine. That may be important. And so many of you have incredible stories of how you've triumphed over an impediment. And that's an important story. And you may want to provide general information. But even if you provide that general information, by the time the member of Congress has a chance to use it. There have been 500 other meetings on banking regulations in the Jaffna Peninsula, and they may have forgotten. When you come, you the question I ask the groups that I like is, if you controlled this right hand and this voting card and this pen, what would it do? If you have a solid answer to that question, then you can leave that meeting with something tangible. So you go into the meeting saying, here are all the groups in our community, and they all want you to co-sponsor this bill. They all want you to put out a statement saying you're going to vote against that bill. We'd like you to sign a letter to the Appropriations Committee saying to fund this program at no less than $116 million. We want you to sign this. We want you to vote that way. We want you to co-sponsor. If what you want is just an understanding and an appreciation of what you've accomplished, there are many people that can provide that to you. Only the member of Congress can provide you with that letter, uh, that co-sponsorship, or that vote. So ask for something specific. Don't leave until you get a very specific yes or no. And if it's a no, just don't leave. Um, <laughs> and the final thing you may want is a letter to an administrative agency saying fund this grant or change this regulation. Now, if you're aiming to get congressional action, pass a bill, get an appropriation, you want to make sure that you have a balanced uh, group of members of Congress on your side. And if anything, a Republican's more valuable to you at this time than a Democrat. If you're trying to influence an executive agency, you don't have to worry about balance, and a Democrat's more valuable than a Republican. So keep that in mind. Depending, so who you want to sign the letter depends a little bit on who the letter is addressed to. Um, and if what you want is a telephone call or something that you can't see being done, the question is, who on your staff do we call to get a report on whether you made that phone call and how it went. Um, you may seek a meeting in Washington. You may seek a meeting in the district. If you want a meeting in Washington, you may just want to meet with the aides. Uh, frankly, uh, Lauren Attard is, is with me here. She does all the thinking, planning, decision making. My job is to stand behind a microphone and look pretty. I'd like to think I do it well, but talking to the legislative assistant um, may be more important. You may be able to get that meeting longer and more relaxed during a district work period like today. Um, you, I recommend trying to meet with members in their district office. First, if you don't get the meeting, you can show up at their meeting and stand up at a town hall and say, will you do this or will you meet with, promise to meet with us this week person to person on that issue. Another advantage of the district office meeting is that I have experts in my Washington office on various legislative matters, so I, I don't feel bad if a group meets here in Washington with my, one of my legislative assistants. I don't have legislative assistants in California, and so if I want them, I, I kind of figure I've got to do the meeting uh, myself. You'll want to uh, Email, email a petition. Make sure that you that you list both the personal, the uh, physical address, and the email address. The reason you'll want to provide that email address is what you want is a virtual cycle. Ask them to do something. Give them an email list of people who want them to do it. When they do it, tell them to tell the email list they did it. Then tell your email list to thank them for doing it and then tell your email list to ask them what they've done for you lately. The best thing you want is a situation, I send out 
400 emails to a group of people that care about something. One of them catches me in the grocery store and thanks me for doing it. And then I go to Lauren and I say, well, why haven't we put out another one of those emails to the disability community? And she'll say, because you haven't done anything recently and new for that community. And my response, well, well what a, give me a list of what I need to do. So that virtual cycle, do something, report something, get thanked for something, be encouraged, have a list of people to tell that you've done it. Uh, I'd like to think my colleagues would, would be a virtuous tree falling in the forest with no one to hear, but most of us want to do good things when people who agree with them noticed. Um, and then finally, I would urge the disability community uh, with several organizations in a, in a, um, um, in a coalition to, um, to rate the voting records of members of Congress. And that, and, uh, that rating uh, can be not only how did you vote, but what did you co-sponsor, and give awards not because our shelves are empty, but because it gives you, that's a powerful thing you can do that we can then use to brag uh, to our constituents that we're actually doing something in Washington. I look forward to, to hearing the, the next panel. I'm almost jealous that I, I don't get, I do get to comment on, on, on their stuff because I have the microphone. Um, <laughs> I'll just make a prediction about this election. The, the Bernie and Trump tsunami is for the establishment, for the elite, that first heart attack that you make it through. And we all know the guy who a month after he's out of the hospital is eating the cheeseburgers on the couch. I think the elites will survive this and they will go back to trying to pass TPP in a lame duck session, which is the equivalent of having a big rib dinner on the couch a month after a heart attack. And uh, if they succeed, then in 2020, uh, the elites will have that, that second heart attack. So um, I, the, what happened this year with both Bernie and Trump was way outside the thinking of what the elites uh, believed would happen and they'll either adopt policy changes or they'll go back to the same old behavior. So I'm Brad Sherman from Sherman Oaks, and thank you very much.